God, I'm not sure that I'm your man. And, and we've talked about this in the past, haven't we, as we've looked at some of the characters. I, I'm not the guy. And um, I think we need to keep this verse handy as we get up each day because there may be something that you will encounter that might make a difference. We are going to look at a book in the Bible that we don't look at very often. Uh, I cannot count the number of times, but it hadn't been very many, that I've actually sat down and, and we've studied the book of Esther. Uh, it's a small book, and we probably have a hard time finding it, but if you can find the book of Job, Esther is just before Job. So I'll give you a chance to kind of look that up. Uh, Esther is just before Job and, and right after Nehemiah. But um, this lady was definitely a big part of one of God's important turning points. And uh, we'll see how important she was to that process as we move through the lesson today. I think that it, two of the things that struck me about Esther was she was a brave young woman. We don't know how old she was, but she wasn't too old. Uh, and she was very brave in terms of trying to do God's will. And she showed a lot of faith in God and the fact that God wanted her to step up and do what she needed to do to save her people. And so there, there was bravery involved in her action and there was uh, a lot of faith that God was going to do it because she was facing at the time one of the mightiest countries in the world. And we'll do a little walk down history lane to kind of put this in perspective. But uh, quite a lady, and um, if you haven't read the book of Esther lately, I would challenge you to read it. It doesn't take long. It's a very short book. But I think you'd gain a lot from reading the book itself. Uh, we have been talking this whole time about the fact that there have been points, very decisive points, where God has made a turn to make sure his will is done. And hopefully that can be a lesson to us today, that God is still having turning points in our lives so we can serve him. Uh, her heritage, uh, as we look at who Esther was, she was of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, one of the main characters in the book is her cousin, Mordecai, and you may remember that name. Uh, she was a captive in the city of Susa. And um, at that time, uh, the Persians were in charge of everything. We sometimes hear Medes and Persians. Well, uh, the Medes defeated Babylon, and the Persians came in and, and defeated them, and they kind of had the Mede, Medo-Persian Empire there. It was a mixture. But they were the most powerful uh, entity at that time. And so she was in the capital city of Susa uh, when we hear about her. Let's do that history lesson now. And um, you remember that the uh, children of Israel were, were carried off. The southern tribes were carried off to Babylonian captivity starting in about 601. Uh, some of the more prominent people were the, the kings on the royal house. The, uh, the man Daniel and his buddies, Meshach and Abednego and Shadrach, they were a part of the people carried off from Jerusalem up to uh, Babylon in that captivity around 601 in the years following. And um, uh, the book of Daniel, and we've looked at that recently. I, we've had some lessons on that. Outstanding book. And again, shows God's power in the midst of captivity. Well, following that, the, as I said, the Medes and the Persians, the Medes first and the Persians defeated Babylon. Uh, you go look farther down the road, and the Greeks eventually beat the Persians. And they took over for a while. And then the Romans <laughs> defeated the Greeks. So we had these powers coming along there. And then uh, when the Romans took over, uh, that's when the time was right for Jesus to come. And it was during the Roman Empire that the birth of Jesus took place. So we see that a lot of things had to happen 
until at just the right time, as the scripture says, at just the right time. I take a lot of comfort in that verse, at just the right time, because I think we're living in just the right time. It's not like that we got a lot of choices. Ron and I were talking about age today, and um, I told him I wanted to be just like him when I got to be his age. Uh, Actually, I think we're the same age. I think I'm a little older. But anyway, I think we can take comfort that God does things at just the right time for you and me. And if you can look back and remember some of the things that took place in your life, it might not have been on your timing, but something good happened. And, and there was a turn, a turning point, and you didn't see it coming. But all of a sudden there it was. And I know I've kind of said, Wow, I didn't see that coming, but boy, was that ever a good turning point. I thought I was going this way. I ended up going this way, and that was a whole lot better. So I think God is still helping us with turning points as far as uh, what he wants us to do in this life. Um, let's move ahead here as we uh, get into looking at this. One of the unique things about this book, and you check me on this, okay? This week you go back and read the book of Esther and see if I'm right. But I think I'm right that in this book, you will not see God mentioned. You will not see the name God. And you think, well, now wait a minute. <laughs> this is part of the Bible, right? Uh, and God's not mentioned in there? Don't think you'll find it. There's no mention of prayer in there. That, that kind of gets your attention. There's no mention about worshiping in there. And there's no mention about sacrifice. So all these things that at that point were much a part of godly people, you won't find mentioned in this book at all. It's kind of a unique thing about the book of Esther. And you say, that just doesn't seem to fit what we think of as books of the Bible. But that's the way it is. And you check me out to be sure, okay? Um, as we look at... Uh, her story, uh, she was elevated from being one of the women in the king's harem to the throne. And again, that's a remarkable turning point in her life in that uh, I don't know how many wives <laughs> the king had at that time, but it was common for them to have many wives and concubines and they would have a harem and... and um, they would call the wives up and, and so forth. Um, and we know that the one wife fell out of favor with the king, and we're not going to have time to go into all those details, but he pretty much banished the wife, said, I'm done with you. So then they had to come up with another primary queen or wife for him. And um, we find that uh, here's Esther, and she must have been a pretty woman. It says that in the Bible. And she was selected out of all the different wives and concubines to become the queen and to share the throne with uh, the king there. And uh, as she was selected and prepared, and it takes a while to get her ready, but as, as she was prepared, um, the king, Xerxes, um, brought her forth, announced her, placed her on the throne with her. And one of the things I think is interesting, he, he could have had any of the women be there, but he selected Esther. And uh, let me back up. One of the things about that was when she submitted her resume, she really didn't do that, but I'll throw that out there. She seemed to forget to put her nationality on there. The fact that she was a Jew. And whether that would have mattered to the king or not, we don't know. But he was not a godly person. He did not worship Jehovah God. Uh, they worshiped idols, like many of the countries in that part of the world. And yet, she was selected. God's turning point. Yes, sir, Ron. Didn't Mordecai, her, her uncle or whatever he was. Cousin. Cousin have, have something to do with pushing her forward? He did. Uh, Mordecai, I'm glad you mentioned that. He had a position uh, with the king. It wasn't very high up, but it, initially he, he was working for the king, and, 
And uh, he had some influence, I think, in suggesting that she be considered, and he certainly influenced Esther, and we'll see that as we move through the story, to uh, look at God and, and look at how she could serve God, even in a de desperate situation. But the process went forward, and the lot fell on Esther, and so she went from being just another woman in the harem to sitting on the throne as the queen along with uh, Xerxes the king at that time. But it was not known, as far as we can tell from the scripture, that she was a, a Jewish woman. And whether that would have made a difference, I don't know. But uh, again, looking at how things work, it kind of uh, makes you wonder. Uh, so she is in good shape. She's on the throne. Um, uh, and let's see if we can make this go ahead. Come on, come on. All right, there we go. Uh, the plot thickens as we see her t assuming the throne because as the story tells us, Haman, who was an Amalekite, he was promoted to a high position. And as you can see, in, hopefully in that illustration on the left, he was a rather proud man. And he was so important, at least in his mind, you know, you've heard about that, he's a legend in his own mind. I think that described Am uh, Haman and so as he would walk by, he expected everyone to bow to him. Well, he walked by and Mordecai said, I can't bow to a man. I will not bow down before a man. And as you can see, that did disturb Haman a little bit, that uh, Mordecai would have the nerve not to bow down because he was an important person. Have you ever known a person that was really important in their own mind? Uh, hopefully you've never worked for someone like that, um, but I've known people over the years and, and you think, why do they act like that? Um, it was kind of the, I hate to say this, but it was kind of the, the Barney Five type person. You remember Barney Five? He was pretty important. He was so important, he had a gun and kept his bullet in the pocket. Isn't that the way it worked? Could not put the bullet in the, in the gun, but you could carry it in your pocket, and that was probably a good idea. But uh, Haman, he was a legend in his own mind. He was very important. And when Mordecai said, I will not bow down to a man, that didn't go well with Haman. And that becomes a part of the story, too. That's one of the little pieces that makes his story move ahead. Um, so Mordecai gets in good with the king. And uh, the law of the Medes and Persians was such that if the king said something, we're going to do this. He makes a decision. The law of the Medes and the Persians, as it says, cannot be changed. Once it's made a law, that's it. You have to carry it out. So uh, Haman goes to the king and he said, you know, king, we got all these Jews in the kingdom here, and they're really not good people. Now, this is a paraphrase. Uh, and I think our kingdom would be better if you just wipe those people out. Let's just get rid of those people and improve the kingdom. And you'd be a great king if you do this. So the king says, well, maybe you got a point there. That's the Bet's version. Uh, you won't see that in Esther, but it, that's the essence of it. So he says, okay, uh, you got a good point. So I'm going to make a law that on such and such a day, people can go out and kill the Jews. And not only kill them, but take all their possessions. Now that was a little more incentive, right? You can take their house. You can take their cattle. You can take whatever they've got, their gold, if they had gold. And the Jews were pretty much spread around the area there, so they were all over the place. Well, on this day, if you're not a Jew, you can get up, kill the Jews, and take their possessions and... There you go. So um, that was the law of the Medes and the Persians, and that was it. And it was going to happen on a certain day. Um, Mordecai hears about it because he's right around what's going on, and he realizes that, um, I think he realized, and this is my version of it, I think he realized that 
we can't let this happen. Number one, we can't have all these people, men, women, and children, killed. Uh, God has made many promises that he was going to fulfill through his nation of people. And we can't let this happen. But it's a law of the Medes and Persians, so what are we going to do? So he goes to Esther, and he says, Esther, you've got to do something about this. You're the only one that can do anything to make sure this catastrophe doesn't happen. Let's stop a minute, and what do you think, and again, we're just thinking here, what do you think might have gone through the mind of Esther when Mordecai comes and says, you've heard about this decree that all the Jews are going to be killed on such and such a day and, and all this and be wiped out. Any thoughts about what might have gone through Esther's mind as he approached her on that? I have a mic man. He's ready. His name isn't Mike, though, but he's, he's ready. Who's, who's got a thought? There we go. I would just think that if I was told that it was up to me to save my people, it would be a lot of pressure. A little bit of pressure there. Uh, and I suspect Esther may have thought that. Uh, you know, it's a pretty human reaction. Um, other thoughts or other things that went through her mind or might go through your mind if you were in her boat? She was a Jew and she knew that her, her life was in peril unless that was just said, and I missed it. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Mordecai pretty much says that. You know, you're a Jewish person too. Now, it wasn't known, I guess, among the king and his court necessarily, but you're at jeopardy. It isn't just all those people, but you, even though it wasn't on your resume, you're, you're in that group that's at risk of being annihilated. Uh, anything else that uh, you think might have run through her little young head there? I think she's also probably thinking, what can, who am I? What can I do? I can't even approach the king without being killed. Like, I can't even, I can't even request a, a sit-down with him. He has to request me. It's, it's a very intricate series that she has to go through that God has to protect her from. And, and as you said, she's a very brave, very faithful woman because that was just unheard of at this time. That's a lot of, like I said, a lot of pressure with, with very little hope for outcome except the hope of the Lord. Yeah, uh, you bring up that point that a person could approach the king only if he invited them to come. And if you approach the king and he didn't want to see you, you could be killed. That could be the end of your life right there. You talk about a pretty strict situation. Uh, I, I know in my past I've tried to see people, maybe a doctor or somebody else, and you couldn't get in right away. But uh, sometimes they'd say, well, come on, we'll work you in. <laughs> that didn't work that way with uh, the king. You came without an appointment, and uh, that was the end of your life right there. So there was a very definite threat that she was facing when Mordecai says, you know, you need to go and talk to the king about this. We've got we to work on this project, and we've got to do it quickly because the day's coming. There was an urgency about this situation that they were faced with. And um, Esther, wait a minute, let's get the mic back there so we can hear. Esther was chosen, was chosen, be, chosen because Vassar, up the close, past queen, past queen, did not want to be displayed in the kingdom as something of, of beauty. She didn't didn't want that. So the king went out and summoned the people and went out and selected and selected Esther because of her of her beauty right and she was raised to a large degree by Mordecai and she respected Mordecai and the and both Esther and Mordecai were Jews and so they had they had to protect the remaining part of the the Jewish nation of people at, the, at that time. 
And That's right. You're uh, exactly right. You know, the, the, the Esther listened to Mordecai out of respect of what the man had did for her through those years. And what, what they were, what, uh, what Haman was going to do. Haman tried to get the king to do or didn't get the king to do. Right. The, the the former, the former queen uh, had said she's not going to be a sex symbol. I'm using the modern technology. And so the king got rid of her. He, he wanted to parade her around and, and use her as, as a sex symbol, we'd say today. And she said no, and that's how he ousted her. And was looking for another beautiful queen, and Esther rose to the top. And uh, you're right, Mordecai and Esther were relatives, we think cousins. Mordecai had a big hand in raising her, so there was a respect there between Mordecai and Esther. I think she she uh, felt that what he was saying to her was worth listening to because he had taken care of her. If you and if you've had parents, or maybe you've had a brother or sister or some other relative that helped to take care of you, there's a relationship and there's a building of respect there, and I think we see that clearly in this story. So. If you look in chapter 4 of Esther, if you've got it handy there, he brings this dilemma to her and suggests that uh, indeed she needs to play a part. I'm looking at verse 12 of uh, chapter 4. It says, When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back his answer. Do not think that because you are the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? Uh, who knows but, but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. Uh, comment way in the back. Ron, can you help me out there? Just as was said before, I believe that Esther was definitely scared because she knows she was chosen by the king. But as she stated in um, verses earlier in this chapter, she had been there 30 days and the king hadn't called on her. So she start maybe had some doubt in what she could, you know, um, in what she could do because here she was in the king's house, but yet she was chosen, but yet he has not expressed any need for her for all this time. So she didn't see how she could help in the situation. You raise a good point. It's been quite a while since they'd had any communication. Does he still like me? Am I still one of his favored wives? Do I have any uh, influence? Um, and he, she knew the law. If I go there and he hasn't asked me and he doesn't hold out his scepter, I'm a dead woman. And so there was a lot of pressure uh, that she was feeling about whether she should go or not. Uh, this phrase, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I like to think that's one that we can use. I'll throw that out at you this morning. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom of God for such a time as this. Have you looked at the times we're in lately? <laughs> Have you watched the news? Have you paid attention to what's going on in your neighborhood or in, in our county or in our state and some of the unrest that's taking place around the world, the, the chaos that we seem to be experiencing on a daily basis? Do uh, you ever feel like, well, <laughs> I'm just little old me. I just live down the road there in this little place and um, I don't have any power or anything. Uh, and so I guess there's not much I can do. But I throw this verse out at you. Who knows whether or not you have come to God's kingdom at this day for such a time as we are experiencing right now. Think about it a minute. And I know what I'm thinking. Hey, I'm just one little old man. <laughs> I don't know about anybody in a powerful position. Uh, I'm not a rich man that has financial influence over people. Uh, I'm just an old retired guy. I'm, I'm about like Ron. 
a uh, couple old retired guys. Um, God, I'm not sure that I'm your man. And, and we've talked about this in the past, haven't we, as we've looked at some of the characters. I, I'm not the guy. And uh, I think we need to keep this verse handy as we get up each day because there may be something that you will encounter that might make a difference. And I'm not talking about a big difference. Uh, I know many of us are very concerned about the war on the other side of the world. Uh, people being killed every day in the Ukraine. And I know people have prayed about it. I have that that can stop, that there can be a peaceful solution to that issue that's going on right now. And hopefully there will be an end to that. Uh, but there's not much I can do. If I flew over there, if I jumped on your plane, you dropped me off. Well, I'd like you to land. Well, maybe not, come to think of it. But anyway, if he dropped me off over there, I'm not sure that I know enough and have any kind of influence that what could I do to stop that? I don't know. But I know I can pray about it, and you can pray about it, and we can ask God to do something to help this situation. And so who knows but whether you're here right now and you're still alive and you got your brain and it works for such a time as this and God's going to use you. And I think a lot of times it's the little things. Uh, it's not the big things. Maybe the little things you can do. Uh, did you ever go to the grocery store and the person's, uh, you're the, the 100th person customer and she's <laughs> taking the stuff and running it over the thing and and uh and you give her a smile and you talk to her and and you wish her well uh and you get a smile out of it you know that's probably pretty good if you've ever worked in a job where it was pretty monotonous same old same old all the time and somebody came along and gave you a good word that can brighten your day well i digress but think about this in terms of um, this whole thing about what's your role. She said, uh, basically, as it says there in the next verse there, she hears what he's saying, and she says down in verse 16, uh, I will go to the king even though it is against the law for her to go on her own. And if I perish, I perish. She'd made a decision. It's, it's not necessarily a good thing for me to do. There's a lot of risk involved. Uh, there's a good chance, if you just look at the odds, that I won't see you again, Mordecai, because there's a good chance he'll kill me. But I understand what you're saying. Maybe I've come to this position of being in the king's house, being one of his favorite wives, if we want to use that term, and perhaps I can do something about it, and so I'll do it. And if I perish, I perish. Uh, pretty brave thought there. Pretty brave thought. Uh, and to us today, I don't know that we're going to perish, have our head cut off because we're trying to do what the God has said to us. But... Uh, I think we need to have the attitude here, don't we? That she had. Uh, I see a situation, and I'm going to do what God wants me to do as I understand what he wants me to do. And I'll go ahead and do it. Nancy, uh, way up in front here. Hang on, Nancy. Uh, he's really getting faster. I, I, when I first started with him, we, we put him in training. How many miles you been running a day, Ron? <laughs> We're not sure. We, we weren't measuring it, but he's getting faster with that microphone. I think to your point here about doing what we need to do with the expectation that we're going to get what we're asking for. Because as Esther, as it says right here, when she went before the king and he acknowledged her and asked her what she wanted, she said, I want you to come to a banquet I have prepared. Mm -hmm. She already had the banquet done. So she lived with the faith, the assumption that 
I'm going to go ask the king for this, and it's already done. He's going to do what I'm asking for. And I think that's an important thing for us to, to take that on, to take on that faith that, yeah, we're, we're going to ask for this, we're going to ask for this, and, and know in our hearts it's, it's going to happen. Okay. It's going to happen. Now she's hitting on faith. How's your faith this morning? <laughs> How's your faith holding up? Uh, you had enough faith to come to church, come here and worship, study, fellowship. I uh, had enough faith to uh, come and join us in class. Uh, it's a good start. But how much more faith do you have? Uh, she was a woman of faith, and Mordecai was too. And I think they can stand out as good examples of having faith in God in spite of being in an adverse situation. If you just take what the world would say, they're going up against the most powerful nation at that point in time. They're, they're asking the king to change his mind. And he can't change the law because it's been stamped. But king, you've got to help us here. You've got to do something. And we're asking you to help us. And we're willing to risk our lives to do God's will. And we have confidence. You're right. She had the banquet. And we don't have time to go into the story, but... She had the banquet, and, and uh, Haman was there, and he was feeling pretty good, and, and uh, he was really puffed up and so forth. Read that and get that part of it uh, this week and see how that story works out. Uh, we'll jump to the, the next part because the good guys and the good gals win, and the bad guys lose. And anybody remember how this came about? We said the, the law of the Medes and Persians could not be changed. And so how did the good guys win and the Jews not be annihilated? Anybody remember that part of the story? And don't all of you jump on that at the same time. Ron, I'm going to have to call on you. Help I just simply recall that after Esther exposed Haman, that the king changed the law. Actually, he passed a new law. Yeah. You can't change the old one, but you can pass a new one. And basically he said that, uh, and this is a paraphrase, okay, here's the deal. Uh, we're passing this law, we're, we're, we're moving ahead, and you Jews can defend yourself. And you, you can fight, and you've got the weapons to do it, and in a sense, I'm authorizing you to go ahead and defend yourself. And so they did. And uh, you notice up there it says Festival of Purim. That became a festival that the Jewish people celebrated right down to today because it marked another one of the turning points of God that indeed... Uh, he saved his people by letting them defend themselves and kill those who were trying to kill them and take their stuff. It was a complete reversal. Uh, it was the opposite of what they were up against. And so ever since then, this has been a celebration of the fact that God was with us, his people, and allowed us and provided the way that we might be saved, and that the Messiah would come through as God had planned. Uh, a very important point in, in the life of, of the Jewish nation at that time. Um, let's look a little bit at God's purpose as we consider this story. Uh, again, we see this is showing God's power to a pagan nation, particularly the king, that God was God. Again, I think about today. I wonder how many of our leaders believe in God. And that's a rhetorical question. I don't know what the answer is. I, I just don't know. Uh, we see a lot of things in today's society. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer. Got terrible times here. No, we don't. But I look at things that are going on that I believe uh, sometimes are 
against what God would have us do as, as people. And um, uh, at that time, very ungodly, but this showed his power to that king and to those people. I think it showed power, as it says here, to the two people, Esther and Mordecai. Have you ever had an experience where something happened, where maybe you were involved in something or something happened and bad turned to good and you said, that was a God thing? I hope you have. And I suspect you've had some experiences. Um, if you are a parent, and some of you are in this this group and maybe online as well. I recall our first baby being born. That was a long time ago. I'm not going to even say how many years. It's, it's been that long. But I remember seeing him, and he was a scrawny little thing. Um, and my father-in-law said, you know, I'm not sure he's going to make it. And he was just a scrawny little thing. He was under five pounds. And my mother looked in there, and she said, are you sure that's the right one? She said, that one over there in the corner, a lot bigger. Are you sure that that's not my grandson over there in the corner? I said, no, I think that's the right one right there, Mom. Um, but as puny as he was, and the fact he had to stay a little longer, that was life. That was a child. That was a baby. And we'd waited nine months for this little thing not knowing he was going to be that little, all of a sudden there he was. And I'll digress one more minute. Um, when we finally brought him home, and it was in the old days where he didn't have seats, you just held on to him in the front seat there, and, and uh, we had about 10 miles to go, and all the way home from the hospital, he was like this. Had his fingers like that. And we thought it was so cute, and uh, one of us said, look, he's praying. Well, he was about maybe 15 days old or whatever he was. Well, we thought that was cute, and we were making a little joke, and I got to thinking about it later. He probably was because he was the first child. We did not take care of babies, never had one of those critters. And I suspect he was praying, Lord, help me. These people are new. They don't know what's going on. And uh, we need a little help down here, God. But... Um, God's power is shown in so many different ways, and they certainly shown through Esther and Mordecai that God is God. And you better not go against God. Another one of his purposes, I think, was to show that he keeps his promises. He had promised way back, right, that there would be his people, that they'd be blessed, and they'd be blessed through Israel, and his descendants, and there would be a Messiah to come. He keeps his promises. Let's look ahead at the next slide here. What are some lessons we can look at for today? Um, you've heard this phrase right at the top, pride goes before fall. And um, certainly uh, Haman is a good example of that. A uh, very proud man. I've got the ear of the king. I, I've got power. I can tell people what to do. Look at me. When I come by, you better bow down, or I will tell the king, and you'll be in big trouble. Um, he was a legend in his own mind. But pride goes before a fall, if you're not accepting God. Uh, God cares for his people. He knows the capital word there? Always. We need to believe that. We need to in the worst of times that we're in, we need to know that God takes care of his people always. No doubt on that. Uh, God and a few followers are a majority. Who would have thought two people could change the king's mind, could, could take actions that would actually save the Jewish nation? Well, that's ridiculous. Uh, if you are a military person, you'd say, well... There's uh, half a million of these people that are trying to kill the Jews, so we need at least oh, three quarters of a million, and we'll go out and have this big battle, and we'll take care of it. No, God says, you know, I think we can handle this with just two people. I've got a plan. And you remember we talked about Gideon, right? 
God said, hey, you got way too many people. Anybody that wants to go home, go home. A bunch of them left. Gideon says, I'm a little nervous here, God. God said, don't worry, you still got too many people. <laughs> got another, another way to test them here. Remember the drinking, the water, and so forth. Got it down to 300 people. Gideon said, you know, God, a little, a little worried about this. God says, we got just the right number. I've got a plan. Well, you know the rest of that story. But uh, God and a few followers are a majority. And I think the other one that uh, God chooses to use his people. He chooses to use us. Now, God could handle stuff. We've seen him. He can handle it. Does he really need this puny old guy to do anything? Well, I don't think he really needs me to do anything. I mean, but he wants to use you and you and you and you and you and me in different ways to see that his will is done. Now, we can look at that two ways. Well, I don't know, God. I don't know if I can handle that. Okay, God, show me the way. Show me the way. What is it you want me to do? And I think that needs to be a daily prayer. Uh, I knew an old guy once, and he said, I said, how do you start your prayer? He said, well, I kind of start out, and I say, God, what is it that you have planned for us today? And he used the word us. God, what do you have planned for us today? Assuming that God was wanting to use him in whatever way, today in might be some little ways but uh, that was God's plan that he's going to use his people how does he want to use you uh, who knows but what you're here to do something that God needs to have done you have gone through a life experience some of you are highly educated some of you had many skills that I don't have you've had all kinds of things and you think that's an accident that you're at this point? Or has he prepared you to do something he needs to have done? I don't know the answer to that. But it's a thought I'd like to leave in your brain. We're about out of time. I want to close with a prayer. And uh, don't forget, next week, no Bible class, okay? Let's bow together. Father, we thank you for the fact that we're alive today that you kept us through the night, that you gave us rest, that we're able to come here and think about you, to uh, worship together, to consider your word and, and your will at this time in, in the world's history. And Father, we do pray that you will guide us as a group here, that you'll guide us as individuals, your children, and show us today and each day that we have life how you would use us what we can do to live and uh, to do your will. We're so thankful that you sent Jesus, that you gave us hope, that you continue to uh, bless us in so many ways. We pray that uh, we can take your blessings and use them for your purpose. We pray you'll continue with us this day as we worship, that what we say and do will be right in your sight, that we'll have the fellowship with you and one another that we need to be strengthened so we can do your will in all things. And we pray this through Jesus. Amen.